Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good morning and happy Father's Day to all the dads who are with us this Sunday. Let's begin our program, though, with the top political headlines in Texas. Coronavirus cases continue to rise in our state, and Governor Abbott is no longer standing in the way of cities who want to enact certain restrictions. San Antonio required face masks, and in Dallas, commissioners are letting businesses decide. This is the latest measure to reduce a spike in COVID cases. Keep an eye on Congress this week. House Democrats are set to vote on police reform. Senate Republicans just proposed their own changes. Look for intersections between the two ideas. And then the biggest question, will President Trump sign any of it into law? And in Austin, Congress Avenue has become a canvas for civil protest. The city and two other groups painted black Austin Matters on Congress Avenue. Earlier this month, a similar one was painted near the White House after the killing of George Floyd. Since then, it has inspired street paintings all across the United States. The rest of our program will look a little different this morning. If you don't live in North Texas, you might not know our first guest today. He's been a county commissioner in Dallas for 35 years, an elected official that people either love or they hate. Either way, John Wiley Price has been front and center driving the political message and the only African-American elected to the Dallas County Commission. This morning, John Wiley Price is doing something he hasn't done in years. He's sitting down for a rare TV interview. Political producer Bernadine Steptoe successfully arranged for it, and Price agreed to take our questions through DeMond Fernandez about everything from the protests to the pandemic and even his own political future. And Commissioner Price, thank you for joining us. So you don't do a lot of interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews these days. What made you stop and decide to do a dialogue with us today? Well, you know, just wanting to put it all kind of in perspective, uh, I feel as someone who has, has kind of been the, uh, the link in history in this city, uh, new citizens and even some who have been here, that, you know, they deserve to know exactly what's really going on. Uh, to a lot of people, you know, this, this is new. It, it's not new. We've seen, I've seen this movie before. I've been in this city uh, for the last 40 something years. I've been a commissioner for 35 years. We were on the protest line from everything from Christopher Broski all the way up to whether it's media, um, ISDs, police. Why do you think George Floyd's killing is sparking a different reaction across the state and across the country right now? Do I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I, I, I thought the same thing when I watched ABC um, Rodney King. I was around then. Uh, I, I thought the same thing with M Michael Brown. Uh, I thought Tamir Wright. I, 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 I don't know. I, re I really wish I knew. And, it's, and like you said, around the world. When I began to look at the mediums and see Aborigines who look like me suffering at the hands of the police, when I see England and Germany, I, I don't know. I, w I, wish, I wish I knew. But I don't want this to be, and like I said, I'm cautiously um, optimistic about you know where, where this will lead at the, at, the, in the, at the end of the day. So Commissioner, you're no stranger to protest. You've seen this before. But now it seems as if the landscape of protests and protest marches and protesters is a little different. It looks a little bit more diverse than we've seen it in the past, especially when it comes to a lot of these social justice issues, namely given some of the uh, individuals we named before, the victims of uh, people who've been killed at the hands of police. Why do you think the movement is attracting more allies or you're seeing more allies on the streets right now? Well, you know, again, here we go with history. You know, I, I, I'm not impressed that it's that much more diverse. Dr. King, when Swanner and Cheney, Jewish freedom riders were killed, when there were a number of young Anglos who got on, joined them on the freedom rides, when young people as part of a strategy was used in the Birmingham jail. I've seen this movie before. I'm a student of history. Is it different now? I, I, I don't know. I, don't, I, I, I can't 
get the feeling that it's really any different. I Outside mean, of now we have video. That's the key. You're going to believe me or you're lying. I, I got it. But again, keep in mind, Rodney King, I think it was 1991. Rodney King had video. Is there anything that you think this generation is doing that your generation could not have done? Well, I'm, I'm always hopeful. Uh, I think the Bible says each generation will get be weaker, but will be wiser. And uh, I, I, I think that this generation has the opportunity, but I, I want them to be a real student of history and learn from what has happened in the past. Again, I, 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 I've seen this. I've seen all of this. I've seen when there is a, a cognitive recognition, there is an emotive response. And so, so, they, they, so they re they're responding. Is there a role that your generation plays in this movement? I, I think that if, if young people want to listen, we, we've tried to create some bookends. Uh, I know when we were picketing, and again, we were on the picket line for over 10 years, um, daily, cold, rain, heat. The, 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 the difference is, is that we thought we learned something from Doc, Dr. King and that movement. Uh, it, even to the point that we had captains, uh, I was over at Channel 8 uh, for a little while and I think I went to jail two or three times in one day at Channel 8. But, 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 the, but, but the protesters did not leave post. Captains were in place. Every time I made my bail, I came back. Dr. King said, if you see a law and it, it, you feel it's unlawful and you're willing to break it, then you must accept the consequences. He said to do otherwise is anarchy. And so that's what I'm trying to get the young people to say. You know, see, I, I'm gonna tell you something. You know what frightens me? Protesting at night. I never would have fathomed protesting at night. And the judge and I, in, in a, um, a uh, discussion in court, talked about, when he talked about extending the curfew, you know, night uh, is dangerous for everybody. Yeah. And, and so I, I don't even understand it. You got all day, you got all day to be strategic. I, I've never known that. You know, talking about strategy, Commissioner, in a recent op-ed that a lot of people have read, you wrote that, quote, whites are not the only population that needs to develop a better understanding of another group. Blacks need to also better understand whites. What is it that you think blacks need to understand? Well, first of all, we need to understand, you know, white supremacy and be able to manage it. You know, I, 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 unfortunately, um, in the ninth largest county, uh, in the United States, and uh, 35 years later, I'm the only African-American county commissioner. But it's not as though I haven't gotten things done. And I'll put my record up against any of my colleagues in this state, and we operate all constitutionally under the same framework. But I've, not until of late, the last few years, have I had a Democratic court. I happen to be a Democrat, I, Democratic court. But when I had a Republican court, I got things done. In that same op-ed, Commissioner, you sounded different in that we've heard you in the past. You said you uh, know that there comes a point when confrontation becomes counterproductive. Commissioner, you're known for confrontation, and for protesting, and for being pretty blunt. Uh, have you changed? Has it, your perspective changed? Well, I don't know if I don't know if I've changed. Hopefully, I've come to a a, a position in my life uh, the, these uh, 70 years where I'm able to reason, you know, when it's time to hold them, when it's time to fold them, uh, when it's time to walk away and when it's, well, I don't want to run, but you know, that's it. You know, I've, I've come, I, I, I think I'm, I'm a lot more uh, reasonable now. And, and, that, and that's what it is. But no, I'm, there's always a, 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 a time for a con confrontation. I think, again, King talked about it. I mean, King wasn't, Dr. King was not uh, killed, and, and, and he talked about that, that, that burning house in the part of my editorial that did not make it. And you mentioned that some people might find your words hypocritical, so it's reason. Yeah, 
not hypocrisy. That's, it. That's exactly right. We have more questions for Commissioner Price this morning. Coming up, we will resume our rare interview with him, asking whether anything concrete will come from declaring racism a public health emergency. And what does he want his legacy to be? Hear what he told us inside Texas politics back in a moment. Welcome back. We are spending this morning with a name that is well known in North Texas. Dallas County Commissioner John Wiley Price. He has not sat down for a TV interview in years, but finally did so with us. Here's the conclusion of our questioning. So this week we saw you declare racism a public health crisis in Dallas County. It passed unanimously, that resolution in Dallas County. So is that just symbolic or will anything concrete come out of that, Commissioner? Well, I think something concrete will come out of it. If, if it would have just been John Wiley Price authoring uh, four pages of words, then they'd have said, there he goes again. But it had footnotes. If you look at that resolution, it had the, 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 the kind of verification from, a, from John Hopkins, uh, from the Center for Disease Control. Uh, and when you hear Dr. Casanova, head of the local Dallas County Medical Society, sign up and speak in affirming that kind of resolution, I think it speaks volume. Part the, of that, part, I'm sorry, part of that uh, charge was to the governor and other state officials to also adopt racism as a public health crisis. Yeah, yeah, well, probably when elephants fly, you know, you know, but you know, I, I don't have a lot of confidence that that's going to happen. But you know, all politics is local. Let's 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 start at home. How much longer could we see you uh, as a county commissioner or do you have other political aspirations? None, none. That's that's for, for a, a different generation. You know, my my my, my uh, back if if you want to really talk about the legacy at the end of the day, I, I will talk about what I inherited uh, as a county commissioner 35 years ago. And uh, I'll let somebody else be the determinant factor as to where we've gone from here. So whether it's uh, uh, plaque of mines, which you may or may not have heard of, uh, we, we know that, that that's, that's the real tentacles I want to leave uh, in this community, in the southern sector. The sector that is devoid of housing, that is devoid of internet access, that is devoid of food uh, security, that is devoid of financial security. Is it better? Is it better now, 35 years later? And I don't mind putting my record up. You know, when you talk about Southern Dallas and uh, the community that you serve, we saw you really fight hard for them during um, the beginning of this pandemic, or our, the county's reaction to the beginning of this pandemic, when a lot of barber shops, beauty salons, and pawn shops weren't able to operate because they weren't deemed essential. You really fought hard to make sure that those places could open. Um, does the decision to determine what's an essential business, should it lay on the counties or on the state, or who should actually have the say? Well, unfortunately, the 1975 Disaster Act gives the power to the state. Remember, a county is a political subdivision of the state. You know, we, got, we, we get all our power from the state. We can't do anything except what the state says we can, we can do. And so, as a result, I mean, charter cities make their own laws, okay? General rule cities, that's a city that's 5,000 or less, you know, again, they get their power from the state. And so, unfortunately, they get a chance to decide what is an essential business. You know, and I think it's a travesty of that is, is that as I look, I mean, you know, if, if, if there are 176 pawn shops in Dallas, now I didn't know all of this before all of this happened. I know where they are. And you know, in the Anglo community, I think they call them gold and silver. But in our community, they're pawn shop. But nonetheless, people, you know, that we're unbanked. You know, we're redlined. You know, we, I mean, what? You know, and they thought, well, it'll take you so. No, you know, I had people contact me and say, well, we can help you. I said, oh, okay, you take tennis shoes in? Uh, oh, you, you, you take tools? Oh, yeah. No, we, we, we take uh, gold diamond. No, pawn shops take an array of things. 
and that maybe, you know, that Xbox may feed a family of four for two or three days. And if you've never had to use it, then God bless you. You know, I have. And I made that, that, that admission. And Commissioner, I want to be respectful of your time, but knowing that we have the numbers in the uh, COVID reaching high above uh, 300, especially seeing the numbers among the Hispanic and black communities, they're also seeing the bickering between the governor and our county judge. What would you like to see in terms of how we address this moving forward? Well, I think that, again, you know, COVID is like Katrina. It's like a pandemic, epidemic. It's the same. All it's done is, is, is grab the scab and, and, and show them the wound. Keep in mind, the reason it has a, a um, disproportionately impact on our communities is because, again, I'm going to go back to those zip codes, chronic illnesses, you know, diabetes, hypertension, and those are the underlying conditions. Those are the people that are more susceptible. And you Access, fear of getting tested, too. Uh, exactly. Access. I fought for Ellis Davis. Ellis Davis was supposed to go to Grand Prairie. I got Ellis Davis. You know, and, and, but again, back to what I, I've done in the last 35 years, we started the community-oriented primary care clinics, Blewett Flower, Dr. R.B. Blewett, Dr. W.J. Flowers on Overton Road. We started those clinics. And now it's, it was about access, access, access. And there are still, you know, uh, Claude, Dr. Claude Anderson talks about it. Black labor, white wealth, the great divide. Highways, thoroughfares, still divide communities. So it definitely has to be addressed. As we wrap up, Commissioner, what do you want your legacy to be? That I didn't hold back. I, I, I didn't hold back. I, I, at the end of the day, I spent all that I had, you know, 110%. Uh, that's, my, that's my pledge every morning uh, when I wake up. I, 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 I will pour out all that I have. And I, and I won't hold that back. I, I want it to be that Dallas was better because I came through. Commissioner John Wiley Price, thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. When we come back, why did Commissioner Price want to sit down with us? And Governor Abbott flip-flopping, letting local governments require masks on people entering businesses. Our roundtable is standing by. We'll be right back. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. And joining us each week, Ross Ramsey from the Texas Tribune, Bud Kennedy from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and Bernadine Steptoe, political producer at WFAA in Dallas. And it was Bernadine who arranged successfully the interview with Commissioner Price we, we uh, just saw here. Bernadine, we've been trying to talk to him for a while. Why do you think he finally said yes? I think, well, timing, but more so the Black Lives Matter movement. I think it's, 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 it's a movement that he has never seen and he wanted to give uh, a historical perspective on it. But you know what, and then he, he, he appears to be, he's gone through some type of uh, personal uh, evolution, but what was most striking to me with that interview is when he talked about the Black Lives Ma uh, Matter movement, that he was perplexed which is somewhat, uh, I think that all of us are in terms of that movement, but I'll tell you one thing, that it has taken on a worldwide uh, movement effort, yeah. and that anyone who does not take seriously what they're protesting against or denying it, which is systemic racism, will do so at their own peril. Well, Bud, let me ask you this. He, he, you know, said he was surprised about why George Floyd is different. He has a point. We saw Rodney King back in the early 90s. We've seen case after case of this. Uh, were you surprised at all in what you heard? Well, I, uh, it was interesting to hear him say that. Of course, George Floyd has, you know, has the, the stage now because there's so little else. Uh, you know, we don't have ball games. We don't have anything else. And George Floyd is the focus of the world's attention at this moment. Uh, you know, I've covered Commissioner Price. I knew him going back to the 80s. He worked for Judge Cleo Steele. And never did I ever dream I'd hear him quoting Kenny Rogers saying, you got to know when to hold him. But <laughs> his comments about protests were interesting, that he didn't think he needed to protest at night, that he didn't think that was safe. Most of all, this gave viewers a real, uh, a real peek into the window of the real Commissioner Price. He's anti-tax. 
He, he, you know, he, he was a fiscal conservative. He wants economic development and business for South Dallas. Yeah. You know, he's as conservative as Democrats get. Let's switch off, Ross, to the other topic uh, that's pretty big statewide, especially in Austin, though. Governor Abbott is saying that local governments can decide after all uh, whether to allow businesses to mandate that customers wear masks. Isn't the governor kind of flip-flopping on this, Ross? Yeah, it's confusing at best, and that's the governor's fault. You know, he said that he didn't want local uh, governments telling individuals what to do, didn't want them fining people, didn't want them throwing them in jail for violating orders, and among those orders were masks. Now he says it's still not, it's still out of bounds for governments to do that, but they can tell businesses that the businesses can require customers and their employees to wear masks and that the businesses can be fined if they don't. So basically he's saying you got to wear a mask, you won't be punished, but the place where you are might be. Bernadine, we've asked this question before, but you know, he's already getting a lot of pushback from the, uh, from the right. Is, is the governor you know, uh, making a mistake here politically? In terms of uh, turning over the decisions to right. the city? No, because keep in mind, the cases, the COVID cases are, are increasing. He has to do something. I yeah. think he's taken a, a, a safer stance by turning it back over to the cities and the counties. He has to do something. All right. All right, guys, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. We are out of time, but we appreciate you guys joining us, and thank you for watching as well. Inside Texas Politics back again next Sunday. Hope you can join us then. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there as well. Hope you have a good week.